Let's get stuck right into this Dune deleted scenes deep dive. In the great hall of the Arakeen residency at night, discreetly decorated and moodily lit, the great hall looks beautiful. Guests mingle on the floor, sipping wine or water. Duke Leto, Jessica and Paul survey the scene from a balcony. They are dressed in formal finery, to great effect. Leto in a military uniform glittering with decorations, a dress sword on his hip, Paul in a version of the same. Jessica, for her part, wears a ravishing gown, discreet jewellery sparkling. Jessica says, that stout fellow is Lengar Butte, the city's wealthiest water shipper. And there's Esmar Tuek, king of the smugglers. Lingar Butte is a barrel-shaped bald man in a satin jacket. The girl on his arm, a breathtaking beauty with bare shoulders and tumbling hair. Butte pats her arm as he whispers to her. Esmar Tuek is alone. He has a scar across one cheek, a bristling Van Dyke, and a piratical outfit seemingly pieced together from several expensive but unrelated suits. We invited a smuggler, Paul says. Jessica replies, he has fast ships, and he can be bribed. If all else fails, the smugglers are our way off this world. That fellow manufacturer still suits, and the tall woman represents the guild bank. The guild banker is called Su Su, inspired by the Fremen saying in the Dune book, Su Su Suk, which is the cry of the water crier. It also means water in Turkish. The guild banker is a distinguished woman of commanding height. She too has a pretty girl on her arm, an ingenue of weaponized beauty. Leto says, and there's our good planetologist, Dr. Kynes, a very practical notion of formal wear. Kynes wears a simple linen dress fitted to her slim frame. It was without ornament, but somehow strikingly beautiful. She may have arrived on Arrakis and outworld her, but she's Fremen now, Paul says. Later, cocks an eye at Kynes, struck by that idea. Let's go down, Jessica says. On the main floor, the Atreides descend the grand staircase like a fairy tale to applause. All of Leto's lieutenants are here, Idaho greeting guests, Gurney plucking his balisette, Howard scanning the crowd. Even Yui is here, keeping to himself and neglecting his drink. Butte, the water seller, bows to Duke Leto. Your grace, you've torn down the Harkonnen pillories. Will you also destroy the trees in front of this house, or continue flaunting them before the people? His insolence makes Leto's temper flare, but before he can growl a response, Jessica glides smoothly to his side. We hold those date palms in trust for the people of Arrakis. It's our dream that someday the climate of Arrakis may be changed enough to grow such trees in open country. Kynes in Chakobsa quietly says, and they shall share your most precious dream. Susu says, I hear another spice crawler was lost to a worm. Her tone is pleasant, but the remark is barbed. Leto turns. Yes, a carriole disappeared. When the worm came, there was no way to recover the crawler. We will see to it a price is paid. Gurney strolls by playing his ballet set. Leto catches his eye and nods. Gurney stops playing. The silence turns heads. Leto says to the room, As a chevalier of the Imperium, I offer a toast. He raises his goblet. His guests follow suit. An unpraised forest of crystal. An expectant hush. Here I am, and here I remain, Leto says. He barks the words like a challenge. An uncertain silence follows. Glasses held high. Leto's eyes find Susu, the guild banker, and Butte, the water seller. They stand frozen. You honour me with your company, Leto says. He drinks, and they all drink with him, and then the conversation returns. Butte, Susu, Kynes, and Tuek watch the Atreides family cross the room, greeting their guests. A spice harvester is a heavy loss, Butte says. Susu replies, as judge of the change, will you challenge this? Kynes is reluctant to speak on the issue. She seems troubled. I'll judge when more is known, Kynes says. Tuik replies, but the Duke saved the crew, risking his life and his son. His approval is manifest. Tuik likes a man of action. Yes, the city is abuzz with it, Kynes says. Across the room, several pretty girls converge on Paul. They're only a few years older than he finely dressed and practicing flirtation as an art form. One girl says, does your homeworld really have oceans? Yes, there's more water than land, Paul says. The girls gasp and giggle at the fantastic notion. Another girl says, what if you fall in? Everyone on Canada can swim, Paul says. What is swimming, a girl says. Idaho arrives and distributes drinks. Jessica glides past and catches Paul's eye, throws him a subtle hand sign. All the girls are spies, she says with sign language. 
Paul returns a hand sign behind the back of one of the girls, obviously. Gurney stops playing the ballet set. Jessica sees people look up as the music stops. Gurney and Howard converge on Duke Leto and murmur to him. They all hurry toward the exit. At the door, Leto turns to the crowd. Forgive me, a matter has arisen that requires my attention. Paul, take her over as host if you please. He exits with Gurney and Howard. The whole room turns to look at Paul. He takes a few steps away from the girls and picks up the thread smoothly. Dr. Kynes, Paul says, when Arrakis was first colonised, the Imperium established ecological research stations across the planet. Some say those stations are still out there, equipment and all, sealed up and waiting. Kynes is surprised and impressed by Paul's knowledge. She says, long before my time, my lord, but I doubt anything remains of them. The desert's not kind to the works of humanity. Sandstorms cut through metal, the static fries circuitry, and the dust swallows everything. And yet the Fremen live there, Jessica says. Butte comments, It's said they travel anywhere they like. They've scouted out soaks and sip wells across the deep desert. Soaks and sip wells, Paul asks. Kynes interjects, Wild tales. A soak is a place where water seeps to the surface. A sip well is a place where water can be drawn from the ground through a straw. These are known on other planets, not on Arrakis. Jessica glances at Paul, and in hand signals she says, She's lying. There are rumours ships in orbit have seen greenery in the deep desert, Paul says. This is Dune, my lord. There's a rumour for everything, Kynes replies. <laughs> Laughter sweeps the room, and the party breaks once more into smaller conversations. There is a scene that is omitted after, which could be the banquet scene, which is scene 60. In the scene where you see Chani stabbing Paul with a Chris knife, in his visions, Chani was supposed to tell him some words. Silhouetted by the rising sun behind her, creating a beautiful halo, she smiles and says, To Paul, some of my people thought a saviour might never come. She leans in close, as if to kiss the screen, as in Paul, in this case. Chani continues, But not me. Chani darkens, I knew. And then we hear the sound of a knife. I knew you couldn't stay the hell away. And then we see a Chris knife hilt sticking out of Paul's chest. He's been stabbed by Chani, and then he falls to his knees, the same way he does when he falls to his knees during the Harvester scene. There is a scene where the Bene Gesserit voices antagonize Lady Jessica. As she walks down the corridor, they say, He is the one. Kwisatz Haderach, the son of Reib. This is the moment where Jessica realizes Paul is the one. This is after Paul tells Jessica that she's pregnant. There is a scene between the Shadow Mapes and Paul. When Paul looks at the fresco on the wall of the sandworm, the Shadow Mapes comes down the hall, pauses at his side, and says, You are touched by Shai Halud. She lays a hand on his shoulder, which she shouldn't do. The vision is a gift. Don't be afraid to see. If you want to see more of the deleted scenes in detail, check out my Dune Extended Edition video, and look out for the Dune Deleted Scenes Deep Dive Part 4.